and again I say, again I say, rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, again I say, rejoice. Love is mighty and so 
much stronger The King of glory The King above all kings Who shakes the whole earth With holy thunder And leaves us breathless In awe and wonder The King of glory The King above all kings
receive all glory and honor, oh. Even in this moment we keep our eyes on you. We fix our eyes on you. The author and perfecter of our faith you are. Just take a moment and think on this grace. Titus 3 says that we too once were foolish, disobedient, envy, hating one another and being hated by one another. But God in his goodness and loving kindness has saved us. Not because of any righteous work that we have done, but by his mercy freely given to us, justified in Christ Jesus. We have been justified by grace. And so to, to this hope of eternal life that we look to and that we sing about and that we glory and that we wait for, such a living hope that Christ Jesus, we will see him once again face to face. So as we sing this morning, cling to that grace that has been freely bestowed upon us.
the internet, those, Lord, that are in their homes and those that are here in person, we ask that you would reach out your hand. Your hand is not short that it cannot save. You are able. Remind them of what your word says. You promise never to leave them or to forsake them even though it seems like things are so overwhelming the storm seems like it wants to, to wash over them you promise never to leave 
your promises are yes and amen. And we hold on to that today. We release that over your people today. We say your will be done, God. Your kingdom come in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Why don't you offer a clap offering to the Lord? You may not be able to shout out like I am, but I want you to clap unto the Lord today. And that clap is saying, God, you are worthy. Lord, we praise you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Why don't you wave to someone today? Maybe wave to those who are online. They're watching online. If you're close to the camera, just wave. Welcome. If you're visiting with us, we want to say welcome to Global Kingdom. We have a connect card that's available online. We don't want you to touch the cards. We want to do go touchless. So online, if you go to our website, there is a connect card. You fill that out. Let us know if this is your first time or maybe you've made a first time decision. You can also check, that, check off that box. If you want to be a part of any of our ministries, small groups or alpha, you can check off the boxes that are there. We want to be here to serve you. That's why we are here. So God bless you. We want to give this morning and our offering is a part of our worship. And so on your way out, if you want to put your offering envelopes in the, in the boxes at the door, we're not passing any buckets. If you, if you want to text online, you can do that as well. We made all the, the different means for you to be able to give. And we want to say thank you from the bottom of our hearts for being so faithful with your giving because you have been. And so may the Lord bless you and may he pour out an abundance upon you. We still have our camps, our, our kids camps that are continuing throughout the week. So if you would like to register your children for the camps, you can do that. And um, they're having a really good time throughout the week. And um, so just a reminder, um, continue also to register for the services. If you commit to come, we want you to, to do that. Some of you are not comfortable coming yet, that's okay. We know that in time, we're gonna see you in person. But we thank you for taking time out to join us online. And so we have a couple more announcements. And so we're going to ask you to put your attention on the screen. God bless you. Good morning, GCAM family. Uh, we have a special staff announcement today. Pastor Sarah has been with us uh, on staff for four years as our junior high pastor. And she has currently uh, accepted a full-time position at another ministry and we are going to miss you pastor sarah and everything you put your mind to uh, you've excelled at and you've been such a team player around here you've been a, a blessing to the the church family so we will miss you uh, but we are excited for all that god has in store for you and the new season uh, of ministry that he's bringing into uh bringing you into uh we know god's got great plans for your life and you and jensen so we're just proud of you and all how you've grown here and what god's going to do in your life do you want to share anything to the with the church family i do church family i want to say a huge thank you to how supportive you all have been over these past four years and i just want to say that gkm is a house unlike any other leadership, Pastor Bob, Pastor Ben, Pastor Patrice, all the families associated on staff are unlike any other. And this is a house where the Lord is moving. And I just want to say thank you. And there are exciting times ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. I'm just going to ask Pastor Patrice uh, to pray. Pastor Patrice is the next gen team lead and our children's pastor. So she's been the, the leader of Pastor Sarah and the next gen. So just going to ask her to pray a blessing over Pastor Sarah. So let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much for Pastor Sarah. Thank you, O oh God, that you brought her into this house. 
uh, for the season. We thank you, O God, for all the things that you have done in and through her and through her ministry and through her family. And so, O God, we just pray a blessing over her today. We pray a special blessing for your favor, O God, to rest heavily upon her in this new season and this new venture. God, I just pray that she would always walk softly before you. And O God, that you would direct her steps. And Lord, as she opens her mouth, Lord, that you would fill it, God, with words of life and words of power Mm -hmm. and words, O God, that will transform lives for the sake of eternity. So we thank you, O God. We thank you for your favor. And we thank you, O God, for what you're going to do in and through her. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 We're going to continue in our Acts series now. Uh, Pastor Andrew is going to teach on Acts 22. Uh, We pray it's going to be a blessing and encouragement to you. God bless. Good morning, GCAM family. Before Pastor Andrew comes, actually, you can just get ready to come. Um, While we were worshiping the Lord, and and it's it's really, it's not ironic at all, but the Lord laid a scripture in my heart to, to speak over Sarah, and it may seem... Um, small, but Pastor Sarah and Jensen, why don't you come? I know they prayed for you online. We're not going to pray, but I just want to read the scripture um, to you. And we love um, Sarah, um, my little Sarah. <laughs> and um, and it's just so much better to do it in person, isn't it? Just personal. Sarah is a personal person, and she's always smiling. She's got the joy of the Lord, and I, I just love her. I really do. But in Acts 13, it says there were, this is at the early church and there were prophets and teachers that were at the church. And this is a scripture. It says, while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me, Barnabas and Saul. And I'm going to put Sarah's name there. Set apart for me, Sarah and Jensen for the work to which I have called them. Then when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. And so I believe that the Lord has called you and you fasted and prayed. I know you didn't make this decision lightly. And so we release you. Can you guys reach out your hands? And if you're watching online, we reach out our hands and we release you to the work that Holy Spirit is calling you to do. May you give all that God has deposited in you. And I know there's so much more, the gifts that he's stirring within you. He is going to use you. So I pray that as you open your mouth to speak, that words of fire and power will be released through you. And through you as a team, because you are one. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. We love you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Good morning, church. Praise the Lord. (laughs) I know we've already prayed, but I'm just going to open up in prayer again. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your presence in our lives. I thank you for your Holy Spirit alive and well within us. I thank you, Lord, that uh, your kingdom and the work of your kingdom, Lord, is on the top of our mind. And as we are faithful in serving you, Lord, You are faithful to be with us. So I pray that as your presence speaks through me and uh, into the lives of those listening, Lord, that our ears and our eyes will be open to what the Spirit has to say. In Jesus' name, amen. So it's very sad to see my friend, Pastor Sarah, leave. Um, I'm so happy that Sarah and Jensen are part of uh, my family's uh, spiritual circle, spiritual group. (laughs) So that's going to continue. Speaking of friends, um, this past week, I was considering what it meant like to be a friend of Paul, the apostle. And you would think that being a friend of Paul might be exciting. Um, He was a well-known apostle, probably one of the greatest. He wrote uh, the majority of the books in the New Testament. He was a giant in the faith. And being his friend would have been something totally uh, spectacular. But it would have been absolutely tough to be his friend. Because Paul was driven. He was driven by a call that was so settled into his heart and in his mind 
that he knew where it was taking him. And he was so focused on that call that regardless of where it would take him or what he would face on the journey, he was willing to continue. Paul was ready to risk it all. He had this all or nothing attitude when it came to following Jesus. And he would say sometimes, you know, I know I'm going to get beaten. I know I'm going to get imprisoned. But I want to follow Jesus and I'm willing to die for him. Last week we saw Paul meeting with three groups of people uh, as he was setting sail from Ephesus where he had lived for three years. Uh, he had loved that city, to love the people there, established good relationships. And he was about to leave Ephesus and go to Jerusalem. And the first group of people he meets on his way is the Christians in Tyre. They're on the seashore, and he stays with them for seven days. And those seven days, the Christians at Tyre felt that the Holy Spirit was telling Paul a message through them. They were saying, Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. Don't go to Jerusalem. You're going to face turmoil there. You're going to face trials there. You're going to face tribulations there. Don't go to Jerusalem. So Paul leaves um, those Christians after the seven days. He had stayed with them. And then the second group of people that he meets are the clergymen in Caesarea. He's still en route to Jerusalem. And in that group, you have a prophet, Pastor Ben talked about, named Agabus. And he came up to Paul and he took off Paul's belt. And he, Agabus tied it on his own arms and feet and said, the belt, uh, the person whose belt this belongs to will face the same type of trials when in Jerusalem. So again, the clergy would say the same thing. Paul, this is what's in store for you. Don't go to Jerusalem. And the third group that Paul interacts with on his way to Jerusalem are his own friends. Luke being one of them, the one who writes the book of Acts. Because the language changes in the middle of um, chapter 21. And the writer now is saying, we persuaded him. We kept telling Paul, don't go, don't go, don't go. Finally, Paul says to them, what do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? You know that I'm willing not only to be bound, but willing to die for the Lord Jesus. You see, Paul was driven. He had a strong all-or-nothing attitude when it came to following Jesus. And what I mean by that is that he was in total surrender to the Lord Jesus with complete trust and obedience to him at all cost. And you may wonder, where did he get that requirement? Where did he ever think that you would have to give your all to follow Jesus? Well, let's look at Luke chapter 14, verses 25 to 23. And this is Jesus himself self-speaking. Now great crowds accompanied Jesus, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and is not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him or with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. There's one requirement to following Jesus. He wants your all. Everything that you hold dear, your plans, your uh, desires, even your feelings sometimes, nothing can hold you back from following Jesus. No stops, no reservations, total surrender to him is what he's asking for. Any one of you that does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. So when Paul's companions could not convince him in chapter 21, verse 14, he's, they, uh, they finally say, let the will of the Lord be done in your life. Pastor Ben spoke on this last week, but I want to reiterate it on it again because I feel that it's important. All these messages that Paul had heard from these trusted counsel, the Christians at Tyre, the clergymen at Caesarea, and even his own close friends. He believed that they were from the Lord. Wherever he would go, the Lord kept warning him, this is what's going to happen to you, Paul, when you get to Jerusalem. 
But Paul didn't see these words of knowledge or prophecy as prohibition. Instead, Paul saw these as preparation. He heard the warnings and essentially he said, I'm ready to go. So Paul did not disregard the trusted counsel of those around him, but instead he waited heavenly. I would imagine that Paul would have fasted and prayed about it. He would have thought heavily about it. In fact, I almost picture Paul like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane saying, God, are you sure this is what you want from me? Is there any other way? And the calling that he knew that was in him, in his heart, outweighed the suggestions from all the others that he heard. In fact, Jesus himself went to Jerusalem knowing that persecution and death was going to follow him there. Even against the advice of his closest friends, if you remember, Peter said, far be it from you, Lord. But yet Jesus continued on his path because he was focused and he knew where God was taking him. So even in your life, when people give you counsel, whether it's a prophecy, a word of knowledge, or even a trusted source, weigh it out. Ultimately, you have to make that decision. Learn to distinguish the voice of God in your life. And the voice of God becomes clearer and clearer the more you trust and obey him. And so Paul goes for it. He goes for Jerusalem. And here are a few things that we've learned from Paul so far in the book of Acts. The first thing that I've learned from him, at least, is that Paul didn't measure his life by physical comfort. He didn't measure the will of God by physical comfort. We've already read how many times Paul was beaten and, and imprisoned. So Paul didn't see those as markers of um, God's will not being fulfilled. Instead, Paul measured God's will by spiritual calling. Paul was certain that God wanted him to go to Jerusalem. He knew God's voice, and regardless of what the outcome was going to be, he was ready to follow. So Paul's team, his friends, his companions, although they were hesitant, they packed up and they went for him. They went with him to Jerusalem, Acts 21, 15. You see, being on Paul's team, being a companion of Paul was certainly exciting. In fact, in Acts 19, 11, 12, you read this. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick, and their illnesses were cured, and the evil spirits left them. So they would have experienced all that. They would have been around Paul when all of this was happening. But being on Paul's team was tough. Yet they continued to journey with him. They continued to be beside him. They continued to go with him to where danger was, because there was something remarkable about Paul's life. In fact, there's something truly remarkable of those believers of Jesus who follow him at all costs. Do you have any of these people in your life? Do you have any of these kinds of believers in your life? I know I do. In fact, a few years ago, um, my prayer life, I felt, was getting a little stagnant. So um, I wanted to change that. In fact, I had a conversation with one of my cousins about it. I'm like, man, I need to know how to change my prayer life. I'm just feeling kind of dry. And we talked about it. In fact, we probably have several months of conversations about it. And then I ordered a few books. I read about how to um, improve your prayer life. And um, I got some good tips, really good tips. And then I remember one time, um, we were actually at my parents' house. And, you know, by this time, I've, I'm married, living on my own my children, I have my own family. But we were at my parents' house. And as usual, we ended um, our time there in prayer. And just that glimpse of my parents praying and something that sparked in them that when they do pray and just seeing them on their knees, even at their age, just did something in my heart. And then I started to surround myself with people who knew how to pray. Some of them attend our church here. And I found my life go through the spiritual renewal, especially in prayer, once I surrounded my, myself with people who go after God with everything they got. So I'm telling you today, if you feel a little dry in your life, if you're feeling that things aren't um, going as uh, you would like in terms of your spiritual walk, surround yourselves with these kinds of people, people who follow Jesus at all costs, people who go after God with, and his kingdom with everything they got, because naturally that rubs off on you. More than any book I ever read, being around people who follow God uh, encouraged my walk. And that's why Paul's friends stayed with him. In fact, Paul knew what it meant to follow Jesus. He knew the cost. He knew what it was going to uh, take out of him. And he knew what he was doing was right. He knew he wasn't perfect, but he followed Jesus with everything that he had because that was the only requirement. In fact, he was so sure of this that he made this bold claim. He said one time, he said, follow me 
as I follow Christ. Do exactly as I do, because I'm confident that this is the way to follow Jesus. 1 Corinthians 11.1 1. So Paul eventually makes it to Jerusalem with his companions. And Jerusalem is the spiritual hub um, for Judaism and also the first century Christians, the first century believers. But this would be the last time that Paul actually sees the city in his life. When they get to Jerusalem, Paul immediately meets with the leaders of the church there, the apostles and James, who was the leader of the Christian church. And Paul starts to tell them all the good things that God had been doing in the lives of the Gentiles from all of his mission trips around Asia. And they all praised God together. We're like, wow, God is pouring his spirit out on all flesh and all people. And in return, James told Paul about all the Jewish people that were coming to uh, faith in Jesus Christ in Jerusalem. And he said, there's thousands of them coming to faith in Jesus. And they all rejoiced. And then James says something very interesting. He says, um, and all these new believers in Jesus have so much zeal for the law. And then James goes on to um, break it to Paul. He says, Paul, the Jews in Jerusalem, they don't really like you. They're actually hearing news that you're telling the Gentiles that they don't need to follow the law. That they, need, they can abandon the law of Moses. And it's not sitting well with the Jews here in Jerusalem. So James makes a suggestion. He says, um, although you're right, Paul, uh, we understand that none of these traditions any longer merit salvation. Uh, we want you to do this. There's a four devout Jews that have taken a vow, a Nazarene vow. We want you to accompany them, pay for all their ritual, uh, rituals that they need to do, shave their heads and all that. And I would imagine Paul would have shaved his head as well. He's done this before. And he joined them and he entered the temple with them. He did this so that the Jews will say, okay, you know what, maybe Paul does follow our customs. That was James' advice. Because Paul's approval rating in Jerusalem was at an all-time low. So James gives Paul these instructions, and even though Paul knew that none of these things merit salvation, to quell the disturbance that is going on about him, he submitted to James. And Paul did this because he had a philosophy in life. In fact, he wrote about it in 1 Corinthians 9, 19-23. He says this, he says, For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew, in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law I became as one outside the law, not being outside of the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. And here's the anchor. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. So Paul submits to James, the leader of the church, and he accompanies these men into the temple. Now when he gets to the temple, um, there are certain Jews there who are from Ephesus. If you remember, Ephesus was the city that Paul had just left. He had dedicated so much time there. He'd been there for three years, as I mentioned. And the Jews recognized him immediately. And they stirred up the crowd. They began to say stuff like, fellow Israelites, help us. This is the man who teaches everyone everywhere against our people and our law and this place. And besides, he has brought Greeks into the temple and defiled this holy place. They had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, in the city which, with Paul and assumed that Paul had brought him into the temple. And the whole city was aroused and the people came running from all directions, seizing Paul. They dragged him from the temple and immediately the gates were shut. Friends, have you ever read the Bible and thought, what on earth is going on here? Like, why is there such uh, calamity and an uproar to something that doesn't even seem too major? And this is one of those times, because you're probably thinking, what is the deal with Jews and Gentiles? You see, understanding this little bit in this little time now is crucial to understanding what happens to Paul in a little bit. So I'm just going to go over it very quickly with you. Gentiles is a term that Jewish people called everyone who wasn't Jewish. It's a very ethnocentric term. So the Jews would essentially believe that they were God's people. We're God's people, and everybody else are Gentiles. So it was us and everybody else. In fact, the temple in Jesus' day, uh, if you can just pull that image up, it looked like this. Right in the, it was actually a huge plot of land. It was set on 
uh, almost 35 acres, just massive, massive. And right in the middle, where the red mark is, it says the holy place. So that's actually where the temple was. And only certain priests at a certain time of the year would be able to go in there. And immediately surrounding the holy place is the um, court of Israel, where Jewish men were allowed to go. So the Jewish men were allowed to go to that space and, and the surrounding areas. And outside that was the biggest, I'm sorry, and then outside of that was the treasury or the court of women. So Jewish women, they could stay in that area. And outside of all of that was the biggest court of all. This was called the court of the Gentiles. So anybody could go in there who wasn't a Jew. So Trophimus from Ephesus, he could have been there. You and I could have been there. Uh, however, we couldn't go any closer. That was our designated space. That's the designated space for the Gentiles. And no one was allowed to go any closer. In fact, there was a fence around the uh, court of the women that had inscriptions all around it. And this is what the inscription said. No man of another nation is to enter within the fence and enclosure around the temple. And whoever is caught would have himself to blame for the penalty of death that follows. So you're a Gentile. We've, you can hang out here. We've given you the biggest court. But if you cross this line, you're a dead man. That's how seriously... Um, they took this. In fact, even the Romans in charge of that area would allow the temple police to immediately adjudicate any trespasser that would go beyond their designated uh, area of the Gentiles. And they were in their legal right to kill them immediately. Isn't that crazy? So they took it very seriously. And the people there were now stirred up and they already disliked Paul because uh, they misunderstood what he was teaching. And when they see Paul with Trophimus, a Gentile, in the holy place, they're livid. They lose their mind. And they figure that Paul had brought them there. So they grab him and they seize him. And then now you're having a full-blown mob scene. So when all that's happening, when there's an uproar in Israel, uh, in Jerusalem, the, uh, the Roman commander of the garrison and all that was in Jerusalem, they heard about it. And they came rushing there because Rome did not do well with riots. As soon as, in fact, even if a riot would happen in a city, the Roman guard in charge of it would be executed. So they were uh, commanded to squash riots immediately. So the temple guards rush in, about a thousand of them, and they get involved, and they grab Paul, and they bind him, and they start to take him away. And as they're taking him away, um, they set him in a certain place, still around the people. The mob is still going at Paul. And now here's Paul the Apostle a disciple of Jesus, an all-in believer of Jesus, an all-or-nothing believer of Jesus. He's here in the same place that Jesus was when he stood before Pontius Pilate several years ago. And he's representing the same Jesus who he follows in that same place. And you hear the mob shouting, away with him, away with him. It's interesting, isn't it? Who would have ever thought that following Jesus at all costs would actually look like following Jesus at all cost. And as Paul was led to the barracks, he says to the commander, may I please speak to the people? So the commander in charge who had him bound agrees and says, okay. So here's what happens next. Paul motions with his hands, and then there's a great hush in the audience. Everybody um, who was previously shouting at him and, and wanting to kill him, it was like pin drop silence. So as Paul had everyone's attention, he began to speak. So if you've learned anything about Paul, we already know that he's a knowledgeable guy. He knows the scriptures. In fact, he was a Pharisee at one point. He used to teach the scriptures like the back of his hands. So he has everyone's attention, and he could have easily taught them, you know, the, what Moses said about Jesus. Or he could have easily gone through any Old Testament scripture and presented Jesus to them. But instead, Paul begins to share his testimony. Because he knows that his testimony is irrefutable. And even though there was times, even in Paul's life, for philosophical and theological conversations, he knew that when he had everyone's attention, the best thing that he could say was his own personal testimony. Because if there's evidence of spiritual growth in our lives, that has to translate into a transformed life. And speaking about this is actually very powerful. Because there should be something different in the life of every believer of Jesus that we can talk about. And point, Jesus, uh, and point people to Jesus through. And that's the setting that we have right here. 
where Paul is about to share his testimony. This mob that's about to kill him is now dead silent. Paul's still in chains, and he's about to speak. And he starts chapter 22 off with his testimony that we've heard several times before. We're going to unpack it together here again. Paul begins 20, chapter 22, verse 1. Brothers and fathers, hear the defense that I now make before you. He starts off graciously. And that word defense in the Greek is actually um, apologia. Uh, it's where we get the word apologetics. And that word doesn't mean you're given an apology for following Jesus. It means that you're given a defense of why you follow Jesus. In fact, that's the same word that Peter uses in 1 Peter chapter 3.15 when he says, Uh, that we should always be ready to give an answer and a response to everyone who asks us about the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. It's a clear, logical presentation of the gospel. So Paul says to everyone listening, here's my defense, here's my apologia. And then he begins his testimony. Because he knew his testimony was powerful. In fact, all of our testimonies are powerful. So we should learn how to share it. We should learn how to have like a, um, a short version of it, a longer version of it when the time permits, and we should practice it. In fact, our testimony should always point to Jesus and the gospel. And as we present it, and as we become more familiar with it, we learn to adjust it um, to every conversation that we're having. Because again, although you may know your story, of course you do, you were there, you may know, not know how to share it. So that's why it's important to practice this. We know that Paul had practiced this several times before. This wasn't his first time he's sharing his testimony. And in Revelation chapter 12, it says that all the saints that overcame, they were in heaven now, and they, they were shouting praises because they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. So this is what Paul's doing here in Acts chapter 22. He says, brothers and fathers, listen to my defense. And then he shares his personal story. Verse 2, and when they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew language, they became even more quiet. So Paul started off by addressing them in their own language. He was relating to them. He he, he was finding some kind of in into what would get them listening. And Paul goes on, I am a Jew born in Tarsus in Cilicia, but brought up in the city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God as you all are this day. So Gamaliel was a well-known, notable teacher in Israel. In fact, we've heard about him uh, earlier in the book of Acts. Um, We have writings from Gamaliel outside of the scriptures that actually talk about Paul. And the one thing that Gamaliel says uh, that he had an issue with Paul was that there weren't enough books for Paul to read. Paul says, that's my one issue. Gamaliel said, that's my one issue with Paul, my student, is that I couldn't give him enough books to eat, read. He would just eat up everything. So, in other words, Paul was saying to everybody that my pedigree as a Jewish religious person was incredible. I was the top of the top. I was um, taught by the best teacher. I knew the law. I knew the scriptures. I was a Pharisee like no other. And then he goes on in verse 4. However, I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women. As the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear me witness. From them I received letters to the brothers and I journeyed toward Damascus to take those also who were there and bring them in bonds to Jerusalem to be punished. So the way he's referring to was the Christian faith, that's what it was called at the time. And Paul was being very real. He was being very honest. He was being transparent. He was saying, look, I used to murder Christians. I used to put them in jail for no good reason. And then people started to maybe relate to him a little better because no one can really relate to a perfect person. Um, So when you share your testimony, make it relatable to other people, um, honest, transparent, right? Make it seem. uh, So Paul was saying, it seems that I had everything all together, but I really didn't. Because all of us, every single one of us, regardless how good your life is, how bad your life is before, we all have a testimony before we met Jesus. And Paul's testimony was somewhere between a murderer and a Mormon. He was murdering Christians, but he was also this very staunch religious guy. And um, that was his testimony before Jesus. His pedigree was awesome. He was more religious than any of the people he was speaking to. And he says, I did not have it together. And now the next part is the clincher. This is the important part that points back to Jesus. Because even in our own testimony, being clear about what Jesus has done gives my story hope. 
In verse 6 it says, And as I was on my way and drew near to Damascus about noon, a great light from heaven suddenly shone around me, and I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now those who were with me saw the light, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Rise and go into Damascus, and there, you'll be told, there you will be told all that is appointed you to do. Now that's a mark of a genuine follower of Jesus. That's a mark of a true convert. When the first question out of your mouth is, Lord, what do you want me to do? Lord, I'm yours. My life is no longer my own. I accept the sacrifice that you made for me on the cross. And I'm here today to say, you, I am yours. All yours. All of me is now all of yours. That's the requirement of an all-in believer. An all-or-nothing follower of Jesus. Now here's something else to note in that little bit. Um, you may ask, why didn't the Lord give Paul a bit more instructions? Um, why didn't he tell them, okay, Paul, you know, this is what you've been doing. This is what I want you to do in the next little bit. Here's a five-year, ten-year plan. Um, but he just says this one thing. He says, go to Damascus, talk to a guy, Ananias. Because sometimes that's how God's will is transpired in our lives. Even as he asks us to trust him, he's not giving us everything uh, that we're to expect. But in the trusting, in the journeying with him, we start to see his faithfulness more and more. So Paul would have asked, like, what's that, what Ananias going to say? And God says, nope, just take that first step. And that's how the Lord leads us. And some of us here today listening online and um, here in audience, we're still waiting to take that next step. We don't know yet how all our little steps that God is leading us to is going to piece together for a bigger picture in the future. But we need to start taking that next step. So for some of us here, that next step may be baptism. Maybe you've been lingering for years now, waiting to be baptized, and the years go by, and you keep saying, man, maybe I should get baptized. Don't delay any longer. Take that next step. For others, that next step might be service. You had to look for ways to serve God's kingdom, and you haven't done that yet. And for others, it might be joining a small group, a community of believers where you will grow. Whatever that next step is, even for some listening, it might be that first step of accepting Jesus. The biggest step. Wherever that is, whatever your next step is, take it. Because some of us that don't take it, um, we may do so because we're not sure where it's going to lead us. We're not sure if the uh, outcome is going to be favorable or if it's going to be comfortable for us. If I get baptized, what are my friends going to think? How am my family going to react to this? All these questions stop us from taking that next step. And we may say, Lord, reveal the long-term plan. I want to know the full picture before I take this step. But Paul says, the Lord says, no, just go. Get to Damascus. Take that first step. When you get there, you'll get step two. So some of us haven't even gotten too far in our spiritual walk because we have yet to take that next step. Just keep moving. Take that next step. Then the next, then the next, then the next. And all you have to do is just continue to grow in your faith because every living thing that God has created is designed to grow. And if we claim that we are alive in Christ, if we claim that our spirit man is made alive in Christ, we must see growth in our spiritual walk. Strength to strength and glory to glory. And Jesus says, before you follow me, before you even take that first step, you have to be willing to give me your all. Everything that you hold dear, you have to be willing to say, God, I surrender this all to you. Your Lord and everything else comes second. It's not a, a destination that we sign up for. It's not an item that we grasp onto. It's not even a philosophy that, that we start to live out. It's a person that we begin to follow. So are you willing to follow Jesus at all costs, regardless of where the low road may lead? If you are, then God will leave you, lead you step by step. And once we agree that we want to follow Jesus and obey him, then it truly doesn't matter where he leads us or how difficult that road may be. You know, in all honesty, there's no evidence of our best life now in the scriptures. I can't find it anywhere, to be honest. But the promise of God being with us faithfully throughout life is there. There may not be a promise of a good christian -y retirement that Pastor Bob um, talked about a while ago. But the promise of God being with us through every stage of life is there. 
So when we are to follow Jesus, we just keep moving and we give him all of ourselves. And Paul's next step was to go to Damascus and you'll be told what you're supposed to do. And he obeys. Verse 11. And since I could not see because of the brightness of that light, I was led by the hand of those who were with me and came into Damascus. And one Ananias, a devout man, standing to the law, uh, according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me and standing by me said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very hour I received my sight and saw him. And he said, the, the God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one, and to hear a voice from his mouth. For you will be a witness to him, to everyone, of what you have seen and heard. Okay, so there's a bit of a pattern that uh, I'm starting to see in the book of Acts. I'm not sure if anyone else has, but I hope you have. And the pattern is that God uses people to reach people. Um, we saw earlier that an Ethiopian eunuch was traveling to Jerusalem and back to his home. And um, he didn't hear, like Paul, the heavens open and see a bright light and hear God's voice. But he needed to hear the gospel. And an angel of the Lord had visited Philip, a follower of Jesus, and instructed him with one instruction, go to the desert. And the Bible says that Philip got up immediately and he left. He had no idea who to expect, what he's going to see there. Even, he didn't even know what he was going to say. But the instruction was, go to the desert. And then when um, Philip eventually saw the Ethiopian eunuch, for most of us know the story, that interaction happened and he gave his life to Jesus. So in this case, God used Ananias to speak to Saul. We read a little while ago that even Cornelius, the Roman centurion, as he was praying to God one day, an angel came to him. He was a Gentile. And an angel visited him and said, Cornelius, your supplications to God and what you've been doing to the poor have come before the throne of God. He's pleased with you. So we need you to go to uh, Joppa and find Peter. That was his instructions. So think about that for a second. The angel of the Lord is right in front of Cornelius speaking to him. He could have easily given him the next steps. He could have easily said, okay, you know what, Cornelius, you need to believe in the Jewish Messiah. You need to uh, follow him. This is the next get baptized, you and your household. But no, the instruction was go, find Peter, and you'll get more instructions then. Meanwhile, Peter in his own um, house, while he was praying, he was having his own interaction with God. And while he had that dream, God had told him, go open your door. There's going to be men there. Where they lead you, don't ask any questions, just go. And then that interaction led to uh, Peter meeting with Cornelius and his whole family being saved. You see, the Lord uses people to reach people. God is the master orchestrator, but he's requiring us who are fully devoted followers of Jesus to listen to his voice and respond accordingly. It may not even make sense at times, but to move and respond in kind. Because that's what it's all about. And I mean, if Jesus spoke to Paul, he could have easily given him those instructions, but instead he chose Ananias to lay out that foundational work for him. And he used Peter to talk to Cornelius, he used Philip to talk to that Ethiopian eunuch, and he's certainly going to use you in your own life to talk to those around you. Because I know some of us get excited about that. I know Sister Pam, that's in her blood, evangelism. But Pastor Bob keeps reminding us that a Christian's work is evangelism, every single one of us. We are to be missional wherever God has placed us. And that's the pattern we see over and over and over again in the book of Acts. Verse 16. And now, why do you, uh, and now why do you wait? Rise up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. When I had returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance and saw him saying to me, Make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly, because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves know uh, that in one synagogue after another, I imprisoned and beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of Stephen, your witness, was being shed, I myself was standing by and approving and watching over the garments of those who killed him. And he said to me, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. And check out verse 22. So up to this word, the crowd listened to Paul. Then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. As soon as they heard that word Gentiles, as soon as they heard Paul talk about salvation coming to the Gentiles, that's where their stops came up. They're like, Nope, there's no way we're going past this line. And they once again 
get back into that mob mentality and shout away with you. Excuse me. <clears throat> um, there's a story in the scriptures. I'm not sure if it's my favorite, but it's definitely an interesting one. It's found in the book of Kings. And in that time, in ancient Israel, the city of Israel was under siege. And what under siege really means is that there's an enemy nation that surrounds the city. And they don't allow any food or anything, any water to come in and out of the city. So essentially, the city just dies out. Because they can't go outside because they'll be killed. So they just kind of remain inside as long as they can. And the enemy camps around them. So Israel was under siege for years. And the famine was getting increasingly worse and worse. There was no food left in Israel. In fact, it was so bad that the Israelites were actually eating pigeon dung. And there was one day that the king of Israel was walking on the terrace. He was walking on the walls of the city. And he was looking out at the turmoil and the devastation in his land. And, and two women came up to him and they presented their case to him. They said, uh, we both have babies. Um, the deal was we eat my baby the one day and then the next day we'll eat the other lady's baby. So we ate my baby the one day. And the next day came and the other lady refused to give up her baby. And the king heard this and he just tore his clothes and he's like, this is, this is the end. This is the absolute end of us. There's nothing more we can do. He said, even God can't save us. Meanwhile, outside, just outside of the gate of the city um, of Israel was four lepers. And if you thought the people in the city had it bad, imagine these lepers. Not only uh, was the city, everyone was dying in there, there was no food. But they had still kicked them out of the city because of their leprosy. So these four lepers were sitting around, maybe a campfire one night, and one of them said, guys, I got a strange idea. I got this crazy idea. Why? If we go back into the city, we're going to get killed. They're not going to let, let us. There's no food in there. We're just going to die there. And if we stay out here, there's no food for us. We're going to die. Why don't we just go into the enemy camp? And if they have mercy on us, they'll give us food, and at least we'll live. And if not, then we die there. So they say, okay. And in the middle of the night, they get up and they start walking. And unbeknownst to them, God had sent uh, this confusion to the Syrian camp outside. And they had heard chariots and chariots of an attacking army. And they were all terrified and they had fled. So when the four lepers eventually get to the enemy camps, they start to look around. They see a shield, they see a sword, they see maybe a boot. They open a tent, they peek in and they see tons of food. And they start eating. They start eating as much as they can, eating more than they ever had ate in their lives. And then they start to see all the treasures and the gold all around them. So they start to bury. They start to like dig up holes and bury the gold and go back into another tent, eat some more, just licking their chops, eating, 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 carrying the treasure. You can just imagine the scene. And then there's this one moment in the story that, that's crucial. There's one of, one of the lepers. He kind of looks behind his shoulder and he sees the, the, the city of Israel. And he knows the, the, the people in there, what they're suffering. And he looks at his friends, the other three lepers, and he says, guys, what we're doing is not right. As much as those people hate us, there's enough food here to feed everybody in there. You see, that's what it's all about. Our one job as believers of Jesus is to share everything that God has given us. And we have the Apostle Paul here in Acts chapter 2 saying that God has given the Jewish people such an incredible story. He's telling the Jewish people, God has given us the best story. He has given us such a good gift. But it's not meant to stay with us. It's meant to be given away to the entire world. And he starts talking about his life. And no one has a problem with that. And then he starts talking about his encounter with Jesus. And nobody has any issues with that. As soon as he starts talking about salvation being for the Gentiles, they lose their mind. You see, in the Old Testament that Paul knew very well and that was enlightened to him once he came to knowledge in Christ, he knew that that was God's intention all along. In fact, when God even approached Abraham, who was faithful to him in Genesis, he says to Abraham, through your seed, the entire world will be blessed. All the nations will be blessed. And, and, and God again reminds that same promise to Isaac, Abraham's son. He says the same thing. Just remember, it's through your people that the entire world is going to be blessed. And then again, through Jacob as well, he, did the same, he does the same thing. And even in the Psalms, David, King David, he writes this. He says, God bless us so that your ways may be known about the earth, your salvation to all the people. So even David understood 
that God was going to use the Jewish people to bring salvation to the world. Again, the prophets begin to talk about the same language. In Isaiah, um, it says, I'm also going to, God is saying to Isaiah, I'm also going to make you a light to the Gentiles that you may bring, bring my salvation where it's headed. And Jesus, at his um, end of his time here on earth, we all know it, before he ascends to heaven, he gives his last sending orders to his disciples. And he tells them, go into all the world, baptize, make disciples of all nations. So Paul is doing the right thing. Paul is doing exactly what God had called him to do. But when he shares his story, they lose their minds. Because blessing the other nations has always been a stopping point for Israel. You see, there are many people in this room today who have drawn circles around how far they're going to go with God. God, I want you to bless my family. I want you to bless my friends. I want you to bless my business. But there's a one person that's hurt me or there's one person that's abandoned me. And they're outside of my circle. So maybe it's a race. Maybe it's a people group. Maybe it's an entire religion. Maybe it's just people that have continuously bothered you in life. And we say, God, I know what your word says about forgiveness. But I can't go further than this. This, this person hurt me way too bad. But an all or nothing believer follows Jesus with no stops. Even when it's difficult, even when it's hard, even when we say, God, I don't feel like I can do this. Give me strength to do what I cannot do. Because God calls each and every one of us to give away our story, even when it's difficult. To our neighbors, our family, our friends, co-workers, schoolmates. That's part of being an all-or-nothing follower of Jesus. In fact, you know why this message was so important to Luke, the writer of Acts? Because he himself was a Gentile. And he knew that Jesus had called us past our prejudices. And that's exactly what's going on in this last part. In fact, Luke draws another incredible parallel with Paul and Jesus. And I want to just quickly highlight that here. In Luke chapter 4, in the, in the previous book that... Luke wrote, um, we see Jesus, I'm not sure if they're going to put it up, but we see Jesus coming into the temple. He opens up the scroll and he starts to preach. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to bring good news to the fringes of society, to the hurting, to the lost, to the broken, to the sick, to the maimed. And then he rolls up his scroll and everyone is just marveled at the, at the majestic, gracious words that have come out of Jesus' mouth. It was probably one of the best sermons they've ever heard. And all the people in attendance in the temple were like, wow, this guy speaks amazing. But then Jesus keeps going. Same chapter, Luke 4, verse 25, Jesus says this, I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time, when the sky was shut for three and a half years, and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. Elijah was sent to none of the widows in Israel, but he was sent to a widow who was a Gentile. And then he goes on. Jesus doesn't stop there. Verse 27, he says, And there were many lepers in the time of Elisha, but God didn't heal any of them in Israel, except one who was a Gentile. And all of a sudden, the tone changes. All of a sudden, the atmosphere shifts. And in verse 28, it says, All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. You see, because as they put that stop up in their lives, we're not going any further, what they started to do was push God himself away. And here they're doing the same thing to Paul. And Paul says that Jesus had told him personally to go to the Gentiles, that salvation was for all. And once he said that word... They start to shout, away with him, away with him. But they're not just parting ways with Paul. They're parting ways with God himself. Does your life feel distant from God? Most Christians I know are either uh, busy or bored. Their life purpose feels empty and dry. And even when they read the scriptures, they feel empty. So here's my question to you. Is it God that got away from you? Or, that at, or at some point in your life, did you stop somewhere? 
Maybe the road of your faith got too rough at some point. Maybe things didn't go as you expected. Maybe you felt let down or disappointed. Maybe you felt uncomfortable in certain situations. But what has stopped you from being an all or nothing follower of Jesus? And if you feel convicted today, if you feel that, God, I feel distant from you, and I don't know when I got off the, the road. The good news is that you can get back on even today. It's not too late for you to say, God, I want to get close to you again. I don't want to have any stopping points. I want to take away all, of it, all my reservations that will hinder me from following you with everything that I got at all costs. And I want to take my next step and trust that you lead me and guide me. Are you tired of singing and reading and, exper and not experiencing and living out your faith? Do all the songs that we sing here on a Sunday morning resonate in your life Monday to Saturday? I read a, a quote last week. It's a funny quote. It's also a harsh quote. It's by Paul Washer. He's, he says this. He says, uh, some of you are worried about wearing masks to church, but you've been wearing masks for years. Jesus has one criteria for being a follower of Jesus. He said, in fact, if you don't meet this one basic criteria, you simply cannot be my disciple. And the harsh reality is that Jesus never minces his words. In Luke, he even talks about people coming to him in the last day and judgment time saying, Lord, didn't I do so much for you? I, I healed the sick. I cast out demons. And Jesus' response to them will be like, depart from me. I never knew you. Don't, don't fool yourself, church. The requirement to follow Jesus takes everything from us. But you see, for those who have been on this journey, for those who have followed Jesus, we truly do find that his yoke is light, his burden is easy. And we learn to love a God that's faithful to us. We begin to see his shield of protection in his life. As we trust him, as we say, God, I'm willing to give you my all, we begin to see his hand of provision over and over again. His faithfulness, his promises come in true we begin to see his healing power in our lives and we trust him more and more this is what the people of our world desperately need in this day and age a body of all or nothing believers because when we start to move like this when we start to live like this things begin to drastically change around us societies change culture changes demons tremble and the earth begins to quake with God's people moving and advancing the kingdom of God. Because when there's a body of all or nothing believers, even God responds and heaven reacts on our behalf. So I figured I was going to end today um, with sharing my personal testimony, just a little bit of it. Um, so last, uh, in July... Um, we remember an event that happened in Sri Lanka years ago. It's called Black July. It's probably the, one of the most darkest times in Sri Lankan history. It catapulted a 30-year war. And riots broke out all across the capital, Colombo. And our family was targeted. And as the mob came into our home, it was only my mom and I at home. Um, I was three years old at the time. They were going to hurt us and harm us and, and kill us. My, my mom had heard screams from the neighbors already. They were burning down the houses. That's what they were doing, just looting, burning, and killing. And when they came to our house, um, my mom didn't know what to do. She grabbed me, and she just started closing her eyes and speaking in tongues. And she felt a hand behind her just kind of lead her and push her. And as she kept her eyes closed, she followed that, that hand. And when the hand left her body, she looked around. There was no one there. She had me. And then we hid out for a while and, until things quieted down. And within a short span, within a year, we quickly came to Canada with nothing. We had, we had lost everything in Sri Lanka. Everything had been burnt. And we came to Canada with very little. And I always look back at that story, even as I hear my parents retell it over and over again. It brings so much faith in me because I say, God, if you spared our life, surely there must be a purpose and a plan. And you need to say to yourself, God... If I woke up this morning, if you have given me breath, if there's still breath in my body, surely there's a purpose and plan in my life. 
And if I'm going to follow you at all costs, Lord, it doesn't matter where I go, what the journey leads to, I'm going to trust that you're with me. Just this past weekend, um, I, I encountered an, another really rough time in my life on Friday. Uh, so much so that I didn't even know if I could preach today. But as I recounted the events of what happened on Friday, I'm like, God, your mighty, miraculous, protective hand was on my life. And because I thanked God for that, my spirit started to change within. All the hospital reports came back negative. There was nothing wrong with me. And I'm here today by the grace of God, not because of my own merit, but because of what the Lord Jesus Christ continues to do in my life. And in the life of every believer who says, God, I want you all or nothing. In fact, when this happened to me on Friday, um, there were first responders like usual, the police, the ambulance were there. But then I called also my team, my spiritual team, my prayer team. And they were there just as fast. And they came with the oil. They slapped me up. We started playing, praying. At one point, <laughs> we even pushed the paramedic aside a little bit. But I knew that I had people that I could call immediately. And they would come to me at a drop of a dime. Because I've surrounded myself with people who follow Christ at all cost, Who say that this is of utmost importance. So when we as a church, when we say, find a small group. I know it sounds a little fluffy sometimes. We use sometimes some cliches that say, do life together, journey together. But in all reality, it's what we need for survival. If we're to thrive in this world, our faith was never meant to be lived alone. If you want to see your spiritual walk grow, if you want to see your prayer life grow, if you want to see you even having a desire to read God's word, surround yourself with people quickly, other believers, and sharpen each other. Sign up for a small group even tomorrow. And if you've never taken that first step of following the Lord Jesus Christ, that's the most important step that you will ever take. So even as we wrap up today, I'm going to ask that anyone watching online or anyone here in attendance who's never taken that first step, who's always stayed on the outskirts, but never said, Lord, I'm going to give you my all. You make that step today and you find how faithful God will be in your life. And finally, as I close in prayer, I'm going to ask the worship team to come back up. I'm going to pray for anyone in this room who feels distant from God. And if you feel distant from God, I'm going to ask you to raise your hands up. And I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to believe that as we pray today, that God will give us strength by His Spirit to do what we cannot do, to restore our right relationship with Jesus, to realign our purpose to Him, and to give us strong confidence of our identity in Jesus Christ. So if that's you and you feel like you need to rededicate your life to Christ, you can come up if you need to. Please keep space if you're doing that. Or you can just stay in your seats preferably and just raise your hand. And I'll pray with you and agree with you. And finally, once we finish praying, we're all going to stand and we're going to sing a, a, a golden hymn of the church, Blessed Assurance. But each and every one of us are going to sing it as our prayer to God as we close. So if anyone feels that you're distant from God at home, just raise your hand and agree with me in prayer. Father God, we thank you for the cross of Jesus Christ that washes away our sins, that allows us to have free access to God, our Father. And as even as Gentiles, Lord God, salvation has surely come to us. So confidently and boldly and with full assurance of our identity in you as believers and children of Most High God, we come before your throne today. And we ask that you have mercy and grace towards us. Father, forgive us for anything in our lives that we put up as stops for your full work of salvation. Father, I pray that if there's any hardness of heart, if there's any stubbornness, Lord Jesus, even if there's any laziness in us, Lord God, remove it in Jesus' name. We commit today to follow you, Lord. We say that we want you at all cost. And as we follow you, Lord Jesus, I pray that you will show yourself strong in our midst. Father, you long to see a people that cry out for you, that seek after holiness, that walk in your way, and encourage the fellowship of the saints. So I pray that as we meet together, your presence will be sure, Lord God, even as we meet in our homes and small groups over Zoom, wherever, whatever means we use, Lord Jesus. I pray that we will experience your manifest presence in our hearts and in our lives. Thank you for the salvation of Jesus that looks different in every single part of life that needs salvation. I thank you for the full and complete healing that we receive from Jesus Christ because of the cross. And I pray that any of us needing that today will experience it, Lord Jesus. 
Father, we thank you once again for your spirit alive and well in our midst, and we ask that you be with us the rest of this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand as we sing the last hymn. God bless you. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of Spirit washed in his blood. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior. Father, I pray that we will share the good news of Jesus Christ, that we will not shy away, and that we will stand firm in who you are, the rock that you are. Lead us and continue to be with us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Be blessed, saints. Praising my Savior all the day long. So this is my story, yes, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, yes, this is my song. To all of our online viewers, we want to say thank you for joining us today. And um, we just want to remind you to just want, um, speak to the Lord and ask him what your next step is. And also know that God 
uses people to reach people. And so we pray that the Lord will use you to reach someone this week, to share your testimony. And we look forward to seeing you online next week. Have a great week and God bless you.